You know, some things might surprise you. And then there are things you can't possibly wrap your mind around. Like, nature just could not do that. It just couldn't grow soya plant right in a live rat. And yet here it is. The most common rat that an Indian farmer discovered when he was inspecting his crops. A sapling soya plant was sticking out of the back of the animal. Most likely, a seed got into an open wound and then it miraculously sprouted without killing its host, although the seed was located roughly in the neck area. The brain wasn't affected and the poor rat was holding on well but was in excruciating pain. It would hardly have lasted long if not for the help of people. The soya plant was removed and everything probably ended well. But of course we can't know that for sure because animals usually don't grow plants on themselves. However, there are exceptions, with polar bears being the most surprising of them. I've already mentioned that these unique predators aren't exactly white but more like transparent due to the hollow fur. Depending on the sunlight, they can appear gray or even reddish orange. And sometimes they turn green when in zoos. And sunlight has nothing to do with that. Concrete floors and bear enclosures scratch the animal's fur, making tiny holes in the hairs and algae immediately get in. Algae don't need much. They live and breed inside bear fur, making their hosts a little greenish in the process. Actually, if polar bears lived in a warmer climate, they can turn green naturally, but algae don't like living in the Arctic. However, polar bears don't seem to be inconvenienced in any way because of all the peculiarities of their fur. Meanwhile, the Brachycephalus pharyngeus frogs must clearly have a score to settle with nature. The thing is, they are very small amphibians, no bigger than the end of a pencil. And yeah, while these many frogs look adorable, they aren't really good at jumping. Oddly enough, not because of the size of the legs or something like that, but due to semicircular ear canals. They're simply too small, which means the frog can't control its position mid-jump. Yeah, this tiny frog can jump, but landing would clearly be an issue. <laughs> Don't worry, they aren't hurt. The only problem is escaping from predators, so the frogs had to acquire camouflage colors and increase their toxicity. And since these frogs are still not extinct, the strategy must be working. Meanwhile, some other frogs are at risk of falling to adapt to climate change because their ability to jump hinges on humidity. As soon as a frog, scientists have tested three completely different species, is dehydrated, it loses about 20% of its weight, and with it, its mobility. The drier the amphibians get, the shorter their jumps, and eventually the frogs basically stop moving. Most likely, their blood thickens from lack of moisture, the load on the heart doubles, and it becomes too exhausting to move. So don't miss it when the frog jumps. Soon this might become a rare scene. You don't need me to tell you about the threats posed by global warming. But let's be honest, not all the mortal dangers nature poses for animals are caused by people. Why sometimes people even act as saviors. Take at least bucks. Nature designed them in a way that bucks need to rub their antlers on trees. This way they remove the velvety skin when the antlers are still new, mark the trees with their scent, demonstrate dominant behavior, communicate, attract females. In short, if you read the studies of various scientists, you start thinking there's some kind of antlers and trees social network essential for survival in the modern animal world. There are many subtleties as to how and what kind of trees the bucks need to rub, but there's one big issue. The antlers are large, hard, and can become a deadly trap for a buck. One wrong movement or a poorly chosen tree, and that's it, turns into a trap. Sometimes bucks are lucky and people come to the rescue. Well, or they shake their heads so much they finally get free. But sometimes we notice unfortunate animals when it's already too late. Well, it's clear that not a single predator will miss an opportunity to grab a buck who's stuck. But can some average giraffe expect its head to get stuck in a tree? Like this poor fellow who just lived in a Japanese zoo and then one day stuck his head between the branches of a fake tree. Yeah, this tree is fake. But in theory, this could happen in the wild, right? Good thing the keepers helped this guy. What if he was stuck somewhere in the middle of the savanna? I think it would share the buck's fate. Happy predators and a lonely skeleton. But you know, we got carried away with the grand insidious schemes of nature. It's time to take a closer look at really small things. Meet Falornis downsy flies, very stubborn parasites. They lay their eggs in bird nests so that the larva can feed on the blood and tissues of the chicks. This kills more than half of the chicks, but even survivors can't live in peace. The larva ruin the beaks of birds, 
And you can actually see that. I'm serious. Listen to the song of a finch who hasn't suffered from parasites. Now listen to another one who has to live with a hole in his beak. Birdsong experts say affected finches simply can't hit high notes. Let's do it one more time. Can you hear the difference? Of course, when you don't sound as loud as females would like you to, you no longer attract them, lose the opportunity to procreate, in short, nothing good. Actually, parasites are a problem for many animals, even bats. Flies, of course, can't get to them, unlike a certain fungus that loves the cold. It prefers ambient temperature from 39 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. The conditions bats choose to hibernate. And while they sleep, the fungus targets the bat's bare skin, especially around the nostrils, causing white nose syndrome. The noses of sick bats actually get white. You can't argue with the name of the disease. There are marks on the wings too. But if only that was the only problem. The fungus makes bats much more active than they're supposed to be, and so they do weird things. For example, fly outside during the day. In winter. As a result, the animals expend so much energy they simply don't survive until spring. Though a life in a dark, damp place seems to be a relatively calm one. Although, to be honest, it's hard for me to believe a life like that can be happy. Take, for example, the Olm. This amphibian, living in the caves of Bosnia-Herzegovina, a long time ago, found itself in a natural trap. In the dark, in isolation, and even underwater. So it had to evolve. This is how we got creatures similar to axolotl relatives. These animals are blind. They can live underwater for more than 100 years, survive for many years with no food, and in addition, they barely move. Seriously, one of the individuals hasn't moved for seven years. No movement, not even by an inch. Just imagine, you evolve, adapt, and end up as an underdeveloped salamander with the most boring life on the planet. Poor thing. But since we're talking about cave dwellers, have you ever wondered why they're often blind? When you get into some underground cave, it turns out there's not enough food and oxygen. In such conditions, you have to save your strength, and sight, as scientists have found out, takes quite a lot of energy. If you give up sight, you save about 15% of energy, and you don't lose anything. Because it's still dark all around, you just live and upgrade some other skills, or just eat whatever you come across. Just in case, let me clarify that blindness and conservation of energy is just one of the theories. As is usually the case with nature, there must have been many different factors that together provided a certain result. Evolution is based on the principle, it's not stupid if it works. Though looking at koalas, I'd question this statement. Everyone knows koalas eat eucalyptus leaves, right? For now, let's dismiss the fact that due to drought and fires, there's often a lack of them. But even in the places abundant with eucalyptus, koalas die of starvation with stomachs full of food. And this is almost a natural cause of death for them. Well, we're talking about older koalas. When you chew hard eucalyptus leaves all your life, your teeth gradually decay. Eucalyptus is low nutrient. That is, you need to chew it very thoroughly to get some useful substances. But if you're an older koala, your teeth are no longer strong enough. You have to swallow the leaves almost without chewing. The body of koalas simply can't absorb eucalyptus unless it's properly chewed. So an elderly koala dies from hunger with a stomach full of food. Because evolution has chosen this fate for the animal. Sloths, by the way, have a similar problem. Only in their case, the issue is the digestion which doesn't work when it's cold. I know, I know, it sounds absurd, but it's true. Sloths rely on the bacteria and microbes in their stomachs to digest the leaves they eat. These microbes are temperature dependent. When the ambient temperature drops, the sloth's body temperature also drops. And if it gets too low, bacteria and microbes simply die. In this situation, a sloth can eat as many leaves as it likes and still starve to death because it can't absorb the nutrients from the food. The only way to save an animal is to replenish the amount of bacteria in its body. Naturally, with the help of people, the sloths themselves would die faster than they realized they even needed to do something. And it's always like that with nature. It just can't let animals have nice things. Look at the cubs of the Delacorce Langer. 
they're not like the adults at all. This is a very clever adaptation. When you're so bright and conspicuous, females pay more attention to you. You eat more, grow up faster, so you're less likely to be killed by some aggressive male. On the other hand, when you stand out so much, any predator can easily spot you. Any of them. It's like putting on a huge target or a poster that says, eat me. So what are the little Delacour's langurs supposed to do? Thanks a lot, Evolution. The Tasmanian Devil Cubs also got a raw deal. According to various sources, one female can give birth to 20 to 50 cubs at a time. Only she has only four nipples inside her pouch. There are five or even 10 times as many cubs, and this results in fierce competition. Most babies die before they even get their first fur. Why would nature invent something like that? Well, just because it can. See you later.